Can people see my screen? We are seeing your screen. It's if you just click on the presentation mode. Yeah, I'm working on that. There we go. How's that? That's perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to everybody who's attending on this. I'm really excited to talk to you about all of the work that we've been doing in Florida to improve data for recreational reef fish fisheries in our state. Um, as Chip mentioned, I work for the Fish and, the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, but we're actually kind of the research arm for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and we're based in St. Petersburg, Florida. But we have people all over the state who work on our projects. Hmm, now how do I advance? Okay, there we go. So the state of Florida has invested heavily in reef fish surveys because recreational fisheries are so important to our state. It's a big part of our economy, uh, tourism, um, and we have a very vested interest in collecting high quality data and information for use in regional stock assessments so that our fisheries can be sustainably managed for everyone. So over the years, we have developed several uh, companion surveys that complement each other and provide uh, more detailed information specifically for reef fishes. Um, Chip mentioned the For Hire at Sea Observer Survey. That is a program we developed uh, initially on the Gulf Coast. It's expanded um, over the years to become a statewide program where we put observers on head boats and charter boats to monitor discards at sea as the anglers are fishing. And this time series has become a very important data set for many stock assessments in both the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic. Uh, for the red snapper recreational harvest season that occurs on the east coast of Florida during the South Atlantic um, federal opening, we have also developed a very specialized in-season uh, landings survey to monitor how many fish are being caught by the private boat and charter boat segments of the recreational fishery during those uh, one or two or three weekend day openings. And that's been a very important um, contribution towards uh, monitoring and managing that fishery with a very small tight quota. And it allow, it actually helps to allow that fishery to be open So because we have such precise estimates through that survey. And then on the Gulf Coast of Florida, we developed the State Reef Fish Survey back in 2015 to provide uh, or to start getting more precise year-round estimates of effort and catch from the private boat segment of the fishery. That survey recently was expanded to the Atlantic coast of the state. And all of these surveys are also contributing now to the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program. We're providing samples and data that's helping to inform that research program and we'll, uh, we'll also uh, contribute to the uh, estimate of absolute abundance for the red snapper stock that will, will be coming out of that project. So we are very excited to be plugged into all of this. And before I advance to my next slide, I just want to take a moment. I know Chip um, had credited me with um, developing this for hire at sea observer survey program, but I didn't do it by myself. Um, my friend and colleague, Butch Ayala, some of you know him as by Oscar, recently passed away. And we, we've we worked together for more than 15 years developing that program together. And uh, I just really wanted to, because of his recent loss, just acknowledge his contribution to um, our, the development and expansion and the smooth operation of that survey over all of the 15 years we've been working together. And he's a huge Lost Air program and he'll be greatly missed. So with that, the focus of my talk is gonna be on the third of those three surveys that I mentioned. The State Reef Fish Survey, um, I'm gonna go over a background of how the survey was developed and the methods and then I'm going to give some more recent results since it was expanded over to the Atlantic coast of Florida. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about some of the um, effort, ongoing efforts in our state to verify the accuracy of the estimates that are coming out of that survey. So this, 
As I mentioned before, the State Reef Fish Survey is focused on improving data for the private boat segment of the recreational reef fish fishery. And this was intentional because private recreational fishing accounts for the majority of the recreational catch in the South Atlantic. It is also one of the most difficult segments of the fishery in the region to monitor and manage with tight quotas. There's a large number of participants. They're dispersed across many access points and they're highly diverse. There's many recreational um, anglers target species inshore and nearshore and others uh, have larger boats and can afford the gas to go offshore to target more offshore species. So when you're talking about offshore fisheries such as reef fish, um, when you approach that as a general survey of all recreational fishing, reef fish trips can be kind of rare. And so what we've tried to do here is develop more focused surveys to, to really uh, zoom in on that segment of the fishing population and try to collect some more detailed and informative data from those types of trips from that very specialized fishery. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, the survey was developed on the Gulf Coast of Florida. It was actually the result of three regional Gulf of Mexico wide workshops that happened over two years. Um, every state in the Gulf from Louisiana to Florida participated in that, as well as um, NOAA Fisheries and Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission. And what came out of those workshops was each state developed um, a some surveys, a survey in each state to try and collect more precise data on, uh, particularly for red snapper, because red snapper management was, uh, is, has been a hot button issue, not just in the South Atlantic, but very much so in the Gulf as well. But in Florida, um, we also wanted to make sure that what we developed was also going to be useful for more than just managing red snapper in our state. We wanted to we wanted to develop a survey that would give us year-round estimates of harvest discards which are also important for assessing total removals in the fishery and year-round effort and as well as collect information on other species that are also caught and targeted when fishing for reef fish uh, such as groupers and uh, amberjacks so that's where how kind of how the the Florida Gulf Reef Fish Survey started. So that initially we named the survey the Gulf Reef Fish Survey because it was implemented only on the Gulf Coast in 2015. After we had accumulated a few years of data and pilot testing, the, um, the results of that work and the methodology that we had developed was peer reviewed by uh, uh, a team of statisticians who are experts in survey design. And after following that peer review um, and their favorable peer review, we received NOAA certification in 2018, which essentially means that our survey has been certified as a statistically valid survey that produces estimates that are useful for monitoring recreational fisheries for assessing and managing stocks in, in the region. In 20, July of 2020, the state invested in long-term stable funding for the, the, the survey, and that's when we expanded it over to the Atlantic Coast and renamed it the State Reef Fish Survey. And I'd like to mention that all during all of this time, uh, the survey has run concurrent with the MRIP survey, the Marine Recreational Information Program in our state. That is the historic time series that's been operating since the 1980s that has provided vital data for use in stock assessments and management since that time for all of our saltwater recreational fishery species, not just reef fish. And our intention has not been to replace that survey, but to supplement it to get better information that can be helpful to informing uh, assessment management, particularly for reef fishes. So both surveys are run together and they're still both uh, useful and important in our state. So a key component of the design of the state reef fish survey was a new requirement that was put in place, which, were, which um, 
requires anglers that are fishing from a private boat for certain reef fish species to have a state reef fish angler designation on their license. Prior to that, uh, the only thing that was required was a Florida saltwater fishing license. But uh, as I mentioned before, lots of people purchase a fishing license for many different reasons. And there was really no way to distinguish who was purchasing that license specifically for the purpose of offshore fishing. So what the state reef fish angler designation has done is it's provided us with a sample universe that we designed our specialized reef fish survey around. And it gives us a directory of participants in the reef fish recreational fishery. This approach has been endorsed by the NOAA Fisheries Advisory Committee, the Marine Fishery Advisory Committee, also called MAFAC. And as Chip mentioned during my introduction, um, it's also being considered by both regional councils in the Gulf and the South Atlantic as a way to collect better data for reef fishes. So this is a list of all of the species that uh, are included in that requirement for, for private boat anglers to have a state reef fish angler designation on their license if they're, if they're fishing in Florida. Three of those species were added in July of 2020 when the survey was expanded statewide, yellowtail snapper, mutton snapper, and hogfish. And the original species that have been surveyed on the Gulf Coast since 2015 and now on the Atlantic Coast since 2020 include the shallow water grouper, black, red, and gag groupers, red snapper, vermilion snapper, great triggerfish, and the cereola species, including amberjacks. So the general design of the state reef fish survey includes two complementary survey methods. And this is, approach, is an approach that's been used extensively to estimate recreational fishing uh, catch. We, for the state reef fish survey, we have one, one component that is a male survey where we randomly select people with that state reef fish angler designation to receive a questionnaire in the mail and they're asked to report their fishing activity for the most recent month that they were selected for. That information is used to give us an, a measure of a, a way to estimate how many total trips all of those state reef fish angler designees are taking each month. That is paired with a dockside intercept survey that provides where we actually meet anglers at the docks as they're coming in from their trip, their fishing trip that day and collect sp specific information on what species and the numbers of species they harvested and released. And the reason for doing the two, having the two things reported separately is that it can be difficult a month later to remember all of the fish that you released on every trip that you took. But if, if you're asked that day, right after you're returning to the dock, the memory's still fresh and you're much more able to recall accurately what you um, actually released that day. Um, and then, so that, um, that gives us a better measure of catch per unit effort. And I would also like to mention that both of these sur survey components are conducted year round. And when we combine those data together, it produces monthly estimates of total fishing effort, total landings and total discards. I'll talk more about that in the next slides. So because the state reef fish survey is conducted concurrently with the MRIP survey in our state, we worked very closely with NOAA fisheries on an integrated approach. And we actually benefit from some of the data that are collected through the MRIP survey that, and, and those data are used in our state reef fish survey estimates. So the, one of the first things that we did was we worked with them on trying to improve the numbers of interviews in the access point, in the Emirates Access Point Angler Intercept Survey. That's their dockside angler intercept survey uh, approach. So that um, the sample sizes for reef fishes um, would improve. 
in that survey. So previously, the state of Florida was sampled as two large coastlines for the, the APIS survey, the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. Um, but what would happen is certain times of the year, say when Red Snapper opened up in the Gulf, a lot of our sample would get drawn up there and that would pull sample away from some of the other regions of the state where other fisheries were still important too. And same thing with the South Atlantic Coast, we would have uh, the summer seasons open up in the northern area that would pull sample away from South Florida. And by breaking the state up into smaller regions, we're able to make sure that we get adequate sample coverage throughout the state, throughout the year for all of the different types of fishing that happen around our state. The second thing that we did was we worked with NOAA Fisheries on allocating a portion of that sample specifically to sites where we know that offshore trips come in. So these would be sites that are close to an inlet or a Gulf access point or an ocean access point and sites that have a larger boat ramp that can, that can accommodate a, 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 the type of boat that would actually fish offshore. <clears throat> So this is, both of these things have helped improve both the MRIP survey and contribute to our state reef fish survey. For the uh, state reef fish survey, we also have worked with NOAA fisheries to collect um, or to, for, to have our supplemental sample of intercept assignments that are specifically focused on reef fish interviews drawn alongside the APIS sample. So what, for, for two reasons. The first reason is we don't want to be bumping into each other in the field if we have one person doing an MRIP assignment and another doing a SERPS assignment at the same time in the same site. That's not good. But also it allows us to have um, joint sample weights that can, can allow us to combine those, the data from those two surveys and use them together in our SERPS estimates. So this slide, I kind of covered this in the last slide, but essentially the state reef fish survey estimates include data from the MRIP access point angler intercept survey, our supplemental assignments that we do for SERPs at the offshore sites, and those compatible sample weights are what allows us to do that. And all of these things together increase the number of intercepts that we are collecting from reef fish trips specifically. It's really a way to, to help us hone in on those more rare trips in a general survey. Currently, we have over 650,000 people who are signed up for a state reef fish angler designation that allows them uh, the privilege to harvest reef fishes from a private boat. That sounds like a lot of people, and it is. Uh, in the state of Florida, we issue about 1.4 million saltwater fishing licenses per year. Um, so we have a very large fishery and then a large portion of them are signing up for this designation. The majority of those are state residents, about 75% of people with this designation live somewhere in Florida. Um, and among, among those in-state residents, you can see that the majority of, uh, the largest portion of them live on the Gulf Coast, that's 44%, followed by the Atlantic Coast, and then 18% live in an inland county that's not directly adjacent to the Gulf or Atlantic. And we have about 2% of them live in the Keys. And only about 20% of those state residents live in a household that has a registered boat. So what that tells us is that a lot of people who are signing up for this um, designation are having are relying on friends and someone who owns a boat to get out to get out there and go target reef fish. The remaining 25% are out of state residents. That includes people who live in Alabama and Georgia, which is close by and easier for people to travel to Florida from and potentially trailer a boat down. And then 16% of, of our designation holders live in other states all throughout the country. So understanding who all has signed up for the survey has helped us de design and, and refine our 
the stratification that we use for the male survey for the uh, state reef fish survey. Um, knowing that and we this was an intentional effort to try and capture all of the, the different sources of potential variability in recreational fishing and try to account for it accurately in our estimates of fishing effort. So obviously, if you live close to the coast and you live in a household that has direct access to a recreational fishing boat, you're probably more likely to go fishing in either the Gulf or the Atlantic, depending on where you live, and take a trip for reef fish versus if you live in an inland county or in another state. And um, also certain times of the year, if you live in the northern parts of the state, you may be more or less likely to fish than other parts of the state. So all of those things factor into um, how people fish and how we measure what they're doing. We want to account for all of that in our, in our responses and in our survey. The importance of this is that if certain people are more or less likely to fish and also more or less likely to respond to the survey, that can introduce bias into our fishing estimates or our fishing effort estimates. So just to real quickly kind of go over how we stratify the state of Florida, we have these major regions, the Western region, Northern, Central, and Southern regions. Those areas are further divided into counties that are on the Gulf Coast, counties on the Atlantic coast and inland counties. And then those areas are further divided by people who live in a household with a registered recreational boat in Florida and those households that aren't, cannot be matched to a recreational boat in Florida. So all of those things are being measured and accounted for in our survey estimates. And when we pilot tested this stratification scheme, on the Gulf Coast, we did see significant differences between people who um, respond to the survey, how likely they are to respond to the survey based on where they live and whether they live in a household with a boat and people who are likely to have taken a fishing trip. So you can see that people who um, live in a household near the coast with a boat are very, so the, I'll, well, I'll just point out real quick, the yellow bars on this graph are the percent of people selected for the survey that respond to it. And the blue bars are the percent of those people who respond that they took a trip for reef fish during the month that they were selected. So you can see, for example, that people who live in a household on the coast with a boat are more likely to respond. And they're also more likely to have taken a reef fish trip. Whereas people who live out of state are much more likely to respond than the other groups, but less likely to have taken a trip. And people who live in inland counties, et cetera. So all of these things get um, accounted for in our sample weights so that we are not introducing any potential bias into our um, effort estimates. And then since we've expanded the survey over to the Atlantic coast, we've also learned quite a bit about uh, which coast these anglers are fishing from. Uh, in the, during the Gulf pilot testing, there was only an option to report trips fished on the Gulf Coast. And now uh, anglers can report fishing on either coast. And we, well, some of the results are, are kind of logical. So if you live on the Atlantic coast, you're more likely to fish in the Atlantic Ocean. If you live on the Gulf Coast, you're more likely to fish in the Gulf. But one of the interesting things we've learned is that those people who travel to fish from inland counties are more likely to travel to the Gulf Coast to fish. And those people who visit our state from Georgia or Alabama or other states are also more likely to fish on the Gulf Coast. So all of these things are important in how we measure and account for recreational fishing effort in Florida. So this is what our sample size looks like and our response rates. Each month we select 7,000 people who have that state reef fish angler designation to receive the paper questionnaire in the mail. And those that sample is allocated across all of those strata that I just talked about, 
in such a way that it minimizes our variance around the estimate. So if those if one of those strata has much higher uh, uh, variability in the types of responses we get back, we can allocate more sample size to that strata to reduce the variance on that portion of the estimate. And um, that helps to reduce error on the overall estimate. We get about 1,400 responses back each month. That's an overall response rate of 20%. Um, and that's a pretty good sample size to receive back, which I'll talk more about later when we when I go over how we've evaluated that. Um, and this is what the paper survey questionnaire looks like. This is the front page, um, and I'm going to walk you through it and show you how we've designed the paper questionnaire to reduce potential errors in what people remember and um, and basically what people remember and how accurately they recall it when they're responding to our survey. So the first question, anglers are asked simply to recall whether they fished from a private boat in Florida over the past month, whichever month they were selected to report for. That's a yes or no question. If the answer is yes, then they are directed to a calendar in the next question for the most recent month where they're asked to mark each day on that calendar that they took a fishing trip. And this could be a, fish, a fishing trip for any saltwater species, not just reef fish at this point. And the purpose for this calendar is to help people when they're answering this survey, think about when they took that trip that they just took, was it was it actually during the month of November or was that back in October or September that I'm just remembering a trip that I took, but I don't, you know, I haven't really thought about when that trip occurred. So by asking them to, to physically check which days on this calendar they fished, it's helping them remember what, when they took those trips. We also provide with the questionnaire this area map that helps anglers report where in Florida they fished for each of those trips they reported on the calendar. Um, so it gives, us, it gives us a good measure of how many trips occur on the Atlantic coast, how many occur on the Gulf Coast, and where on each coast those trips took place. And this is an example of the trip level reporting section of the questionnaire. So for each of those trips that they marked, or the, each of those days, I'm sorry, that they marked on a calendar that they took a trip, we asked them to report certain details about those trips. Um, important things to note are we asked them which part of the state they fished from. Was it, was it on the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Coast? And what percent of time, if any, did they fish in the EEZ or federal waters during that trip? So on the Gulf Coast, we asked, was it more than 10 miles from shore? What percent of time? And they can answer anything from 0% of the time to 100%. And then on the Atlantic Coast, um, we asked them about three miles from shore, which is where the EEZ demarcation is on that coast. And then lastly, we asked them to tell us what kind of species they were catching or trying to catch on each trip. And that includes all of the snapper grouper species and other reef fishes that are included in that state reef fish angler designation requirement. They're also, um, there's also space for them to tell us about their inshore fishing, base scallops, and any other species that they happen to target or catch on those trips. And what this allows us to do is decipher or um, discern between trips that were reef fish trips versus other types of trips. So we can, we are, um, basically it allows us to provide a direct estimate of how many people who have the state reef fish angler designation are targeting reef fish, how many trips they're taking by region and area fished. And the key point about this is that we're directly estimating this from the mail survey. We're not relying on data collected from the access point intercept surveys in the field to gather information on where people fished and what types of species they were targeting. We get this directly from the mail survey, which goes out to everyone who has that state refish designation. 
if we were relying on the intercept survey for that, that these, this information could potentially be biased if there's differences in people who fish from public access points where we're able to collect dockside interview data versus private access points, say a dock behind someone's house or condo. Um, so this, this is one way that we have gotten around some of the potential sources of error and bias from the private access point part of the recreational fishery. We also include in our survey packet this reef fish identification guide to help with any errors in reporting of the types of species that they were targeting. And then the data inputs for the dockside intercept surveys and the effort from the mail survey are combined together to produce total catch. So catch per unit effort or catch per trip comes from the intercept data from both MRIP APIS data and the SERPs data that we combine with our joint sample weights to get a, a mean CPUE. The mail survey responses give us a measure of total fishing effort from those people who have the state reef fish angler designation. But we also apply a ratio for under coverage. This is the one piece of information that we do have to collect from the intercept survey for our effort estimate. And that's to give us a measure of how many people who don't have that state reef fish angler designation, even if they should, how many of those people are also taking reef fish trips so that we can account for that and raise our effort estimate from the mail survey up to account for that. If you hear thunder and lightning in the background, it's, it's coming from uh, my hotel room. <laughs> it's getting pretty rowdy here. Okay, so what have we learned um, on the Gulf Coast? Um, so we've been doing this survey since 2015 on the Gulf Coast. We have multiple years of overlap now with the MRIP survey. And one of the things that we have learned from this and realized is that the two surveys are generating consistently different estimates across time. So the MRIP FES survey catch estimates range from about two to three and a half times higher than our SERPs estimates. There are many uh, thoughts on why that is. There, we're doing investigations into that now. Um, but in the meantime, that provides the fact that this is a consistent relationship has been useful to us because we have been able to um, create a ratio calibration that can be applied to the historic MRIP estimates back in time to convert that historic time series into the current SERFs currency. That's important because it facilitates use of our more recent SERFs estimates into the regional stock assessment process, which has to have a, a complete time series of landings that, that are collected in a consistent manner. It also allows us to track landings against management targets that are in uh, the MRIP currency and convert it to MRIP currency. Um, so it really helps us um, when, when you have two, two uh, kind of disjointed time series, it helps us to combine those two time series into one big time series. I will mention that that the relationship between the FES estimates and SERPs has been consistent across years and across species. So there is, there does seem to be some fundamental difference in the estimates between the two surveys on the Gulf Coast. So uh, what are we starting to see now on the Atlantic Coast since we've accumulated a little bit of time series on that side of, of Florida? We now have two and a half years of data that includes the last six months of 2020 and two full calendar years in 21 and 22. Uh, and I'll point you to these graphs real quick. The blue bars are the state reef fish survey estimates of fishing effort for GERFs. I, I put in here for GERFs species because I haven't included effort for those three new species that were added in 2020 to these figures. So these are for the original surf species or GERF species. Um, and the orange bars are the MRIP FES estimates specifically for those species. And 
essentially what we're seeing is that the the effort estimates seem to be pretty similar on the Atlantic coast. We're not seeing the big differences that we see in the Gulf, and there's not a consistent directional uh, difference between the two surveys. So you'll see in 2020, the surf's estimate was slightly lower, but those confidence intervals overlap with each other. In 2021, surfs was slightly higher, again, pretty close estimates. And in 2022, again, it was slightly lower. So there's really no, um, there doesn't seem to be much difference between the effort estimates on the Atlantic coast. But when we break this out by uh, EEZ and state waters, so again, blue being surfs, orange or burnt orange being MRIP, the dashed lines here are state water estimates and the solid lines are EEZ estimates of effort. And you can see that MRIP is estimating a much lower proportion of total effort in state waters when for specifically for reef fish. Um, again, we don't understand why these differences are occurring, but these are all uh, good questions that are, are going to help us in the future try to better understand where there are potential sources of error or bias in our survey estimates and what's driving differences. I want to break that effort out by month as well as area fish. So on the top, we have uh, monthly estimates of effort in the EEZ. And on the bottom, we have monthly estimates in state waters less than or equal to three miles. You can see that in most months, the two surveys are tracking well. But there are sometimes these large spikes in the MRIP estimates. And it just happens to coincide in, in this case in July for two of these years, which is also when the red snapper uh, harvest season opens up in the Atlantic coast. And that makes sense because when that season opens, it's only open for uh, a couple of weekends or less. And it's a big pulse in fishing effort. And if, if um, MRIP intercepts are conducted at a high, uh, a high um, effort location during those days, a lot of that effort gets attributed to those interviews. Um, but you know, it's interesting that for the most part, the two surveys are tracking well. In state waters, we did see a lot of variability in the, the SERPs estimates in the first six months of the survey during 2020. I will note that 2020 obviously was the height of COVID. Um, it wasn't the best time to start a new survey, but it was a good burn-in period for us, I think. Um, but you'll see that there's some pretty high uh, error bars around these first six months. And, and I think that has to do with possibly our, there were COVID restrictions on our field staff still in place back then, um, where we were limiting how many anglers they could interact with on assignments and conduct interviews. So our sample sizes for that under coverage adjustment were low and that was causing a lot of variability in these estimates. Also, anglers weren't aware yet on the Atlantic coast that they needed to have that designation in order to participate in the fishery. Um, so there was that was causing big under coverage adjustments. And then also because the state waters on this coast is only three miles, you can have a lot of anglers who are fishing for other species in state waters that the surf's designation is not required for, uh, but they may happen to discard one of those species and then we count that as a state refish um, survey trip. So this is what some of the catch data looks like. Um, so red snapper is only open in July. So I only plotted July in this top figure. And then the discards occur year round. So these are aggregated uh, estimates for the six months in, in 2020 and then the annual for 21 and 22. And again, blue is SERFs, orange is MRIP. And I've also included on this figure our in-season estimates from our specialized harvest season that, uh, survey that we do in Florida, just for comparison's sake. Uh, so you can see that, again, the MRF estimates are, are pretty volatile and it is very, I think it's related to just the pulse, the pulse of that uh, red snapper fishery when it does open. Um, the dots on these figures, by the way, are the CVs and they are correlated with this um, this axis over here. So you can see that the 
um, for example, here in 2022, the SERF CV was um, around 40% and the MRIP CV was higher, around 60. Generally, you want to see CVs less than 40 and preferably in the 20 or 30% range for a reliable estimate. When we look at the aggregated discards over across the year, um, we do see a bit of difference. Um, there's two years where the SERFs is, seems to be quite a bit lower, but in 2021, we had similar estimates. So, so what's going on there? Um, so I broke this out by month. And again, if you look at the monthly um, red snapper discard estimates, the blue is the SERFs line and orange is MRIP. Um, they track pretty well with the exception of some of these high peaks. They will draw your attention to not just these July peaks here, but also this one in February of 2022. This peak right here was one, more than 1.2 million discards estimated through the MRIP survey just in February of 2022. That estimate is actually higher than the whole rest of the year combined. So some of these peaks do kind of um, raise concern about you know, how, how um, the volatility sometimes of the MRIP survey estimates can be affecting the, the annual um, totals. Looking at some other species, this is gray trigger fish. Um, for this species, the two estimates aren't that far apart. Um, but one thing you'll notice is that um, once we get into these, after this kind of first six month burn-in period, you can see that the CVs for the SERPs estimate sit lower than the CVs on the EMRIF estimate. So we consider that to be a success there that we're producing more precise estimates at the annual level for some of these species. Um, Vermilion snapper, kind of the same thing. CVs on the SERPs estimates are a bit lower, um, not too, too terribly far apart there on, in most of the time period that we have to look at. When we get to GAG, um, both surveys pretty much agree that not a lot of people are catching GAG. These numbers are, are pretty small. Um, our CVs are a little bit lower, but they're still not great. Um, so uh, I don't think either survey right now is performing well for some of these kind of rarer event species. Um, so that's something to, to consider, but it, they are both in agreement that landings are pretty low for, for that species. When you get into the discards for GAG, um, those CVs do come down for the SERP survey quite a bit. Um, so it is doing a pretty good job of monitoring those year-round discards. But again, the two survey estimates aren't terribly far apart for GAG discards. So, um, what does this all mean? Um, how are we going to investigate, you know, what's going on? Why are the two surveys doing apparently different things, and at least especially on the Gulf Coast? How do we answer questions about this? Is which survey is, is, is right? Is, is, are they both right? Or are they both wrong? Um, so one of the things we've been doing in Florida is trying to investigate um, what are the potential sources of error and bias in our survey, the state refish survey that we can explore and try to address? And can we ve verify whether the, the estimates that are coming out of our survey are accurate? Um, so we've developed a, a kind of research focus um, that's been ongoing for a couple of years now. Uh, and it's primarily focused on the uh, differences in effort estimates because the two surveys use similar methods and data to estimate catch per unit effort. So that's not going to really help us understand where any differences are, are coming from. But um, there are very big differences in how the two surveys estimate fishing effort. So our research has been pretty focused on evaluating the accuracy of our effort estimates coming out of the state reef fish survey. Oops. Um, so our research has been focused <laughs> on a variety of uh, sources of error 
as well as attempting to independently verify and validate the estimates that come out of it. And I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Tiffany Cross and Chloe Ramsey, who have uh, played a big part in, in all of these uh, little side studies that we're conducting. And um, the analyses and results that I'm going to talk about next were provided by them. So I want to thank them for, for those. So one of the first things that we looked at was um, whether there was potential bias in the responses that we're receiving back from the mail survey that we aren't capturing in our stratification survey design. Um, so we looked at here the who is responding to the survey by age class. So the blue bars are the percent of people who have that SERPs, ang uh, the state reef fish angler designation in each of these age groups. And you can see that um, the gray bars are the percent of those people when selected that respond to the survey. So you can see that our younger anglers who are signed up for the survey are less likely to respond to the male survey and older anglers are much more likely to respond to the survey than so they're being somewhat overrepresented in our survey responses relative to younger anglers that's only a problem if they fish differently um, and there's good reasons to think that younger anglers and older anglers do behave differently so we wanted to look at that. And then the next thing we investigated was um, whether uh, there was potential bias in, in our sample due to how people sign up for the survey. Um, so there's essentially there's two ways that you can sign up for a state reef fish angler designation in Florida. One is you can go to the internet, to, to our website, and you can purchase your license online. And on while you're while you're doing that, you're kind of selecting what you want to include with that license. So you have to select if you want the state reef fish angler designation on that license. The other method for purchasing a license is to go somewhere in person and buy your your license, such as at a tackle store. And a lot of times we're finding that people who, who purchase their license this way may be involuntarily signed up for the state reef fish survey if the vendor does not ask the angler first if they want that free checkbox selected on their license. And we actually see this in our number of trips for responses. Uh, so this is the different age groups that I talked about in that first slide. The blue bars are people who purchase their license online and the, num the average number of trips per response that we get back through the mail survey from those people. So you can see that um, compared to the gray bars, which are people who self-selected the survey uh, designation when they signed up for, for the survey on the internet, you can see that people who, um, bought the license in person or take far fewer trips than people who signed up over the internet and self-selected for that state reef fish angler designation. So that does tell us that there's uh, probably a bit of oversubscription um, attributed to people who are not, they don't necessarily need to have the state reef fish angler designation, but they are being signed up for it anyway. Mm. So when we took those two pieces of information and attempted to uh, account for it in our effort estimation methods, essentially what we did is, what we do is we generate a, a, an additional sample weight called a post-stratified sample weight that takes all of those responses that are disproportionate based on age or uh, how you purchased your fishing license. And we, Add, you know, we we reweight the sample so that it balances out and is representative of the population as a whole. So these gray bars are our effort estimates. If no post stratification is done, the blue is 
effort estimates if we post stratify to account for different response rates by people in different age classes. And the orange bar is if we account for different response rates based on whether people signed up for the survey on the internet or if they purchased their license in person at a tackle shop. And you can see that there's really no difference between the blue and the gray. So it really makes, it doesn't, um, it, it, it balances out is what happens there is that younger anglers are, are more avid, but they report less. Older anglers are less avid, but report more. And those two things cancel each other out. But the internet purchases actually does have an impact on the, on the, um, overall estimate and so we have incorporated that into our estimation process we actually do account for this now in our fishing effort estimates but the other uh, important thing that we've learned through this exploration is that if we want to increase the overall sample size for the male survey it makes sense to focus on those younger anglers who are less likely to respond to the survey and so that's uh, what we're doing now is we're exploring different options for how people can report back to us rather than if they're less willing to fill out a paper survey and send it back in the mail which sounds pretty old-fashioned now maybe they'd be more willing to do the survey if we provided online options for them to do that and so we're pilot testing that right now to see if we can bring up our response rates for those younger anglers another thing we've looked at um, and this is something that we were um, somewhat criticized for by the in the peer review is that they thought that we could do more to simplify the, the, the paper questionnaire and make it less complicated and or burdensome for people to fill out. So we did a test side by side with our regular state reef fish survey with a where we mailed out a simplified questionnaire to a subset of people. We conducted this on the Gulf Coast in uh, 2021. Um, and this survey is much uh, shorter. It only includes four fishing questions. Anglers are only asked to report their total trips over a one or a two month period, which we wanted to do too, to see if there was any difference in how what the recall period was and what they remembered um, for their fishing activity. Uh, the, you can see that there's no calendar on here, so we're not prompting them to, to tell us what days that month or two month period that they actually fished. Um, we're simply asking them uh, uh, for how many trips did they took, how many trips that they report, how many of those were on the west coast or the east coast of Florida, and whether they were fishing for finfish, shellfish, or both, a combination of both and whether they fish for any reef fish species, how many of those trips um, targeted reef fish. I will note that we did not see a difference in response rates between this shortened survey and our SERPs, our regular SERPs mail out. So that was encouraging to us to know that the, the length of our survey questionnaire was not uh, discouraging people anymore from, from responding to the survey. Um, but we did find some very interesting results too on what those people were reporting back to us. So this um, this graph shows you the the number the mean reef trips reported per response for people who served who received the regular state reef fish survey questionnaire with the calendar compared to those who received that shortened questionnaire and were asked to report trips over the past month or the past two months. And you can see that there was really no difference between the monthly and wave recall periods. Both groups similar, similarly reported um, about 0.4 trips per, per month or wave. Uh, well, uh, this was actually divided by two to get a per month um, number. But people who uh, responded to the more, comp the more um, comprehensive survey that included the calendar reported far fewer trips and this was there was a significant difference here and part of that has to do with um, if you look at this figure over here the bar graph this tells this um, 
graph shows what percent of those responses reported taking zero trips. So people who had the calendar more frequently reported not taking any fishing trips during the month that they were selected versus those who were asked to just simply recall how many trips they took over a month or two months. So we think that this is pretty good indication that when you provide that calendar, it forces people to think more um, um, critically about when they actually took those trips and whether it occurred in the month that they're being um, surveyed for. Another thing we wanted to look at was to evaluate our sample size and stratification schemes to make sure that um, there weren't improvements that we could do to that. So to do this, we actually constructed a, ficti a fictitious Florida population. We used um, census data to come up with the number of households in each county and fishing license data um, to come up with the number of those households that had license um, anglers in them. And then we took those households and we kind of populated them with fishing effort. And we used some past um, recreational survey data collected through MRIP's Coastal Household Telephone Survey um, from 1991 through 2011. This data was really useful because it collected information on trips at the county level, um, households at the county level. So we kind of use those mean county level uh, household fishing trip rates to um, populate our fictitious population with fishing effort. And what this did was it gave us a population of people with a known amount of fishing effort that we could then sample and compare our estimate, our estimated fishing effort to what that known value was. we did a number of different simulations with this. We tried different stratification designs, um, one being no stratification at all, meaning all households in Florida had an equal probability of being selected for a survey. Uh, we tried four different strata for just the Gulf and Atlantic coast versus inland and keys. The nine strata or nine regions in Florida are what we refer to in here in this study as our surfs regions. We tried uh, less sophisticated, just coastal and inland um, regions, north and south regions, and a combination of those two. And then we also tested different sample sizes where we selected, randomly selected between 1,000 to 14,000 households per wave to see how that affected our results. So um, the good news is that none of the different stratification designs resulted in um, a, a very large bias in the um, estimates that came out of that approach. So uh, in this figure, a, re a relative bias percent of zero means that the estimate was exactly the same as the true population value. In a negative value means that the survey was slightly under was somewhat underestimating that true value, but you can see that none of these, even the worst one, um, is only a, a, a relative bias of negative eight percent. So all of these surveys were at, at least estimating the true value in the confidence interval intervals for that survey for that estimate. However, what we did find is that by the by improving the stratification design of your survey you we were able you're able to achieve a much lower pse or percent standard error around those estimates and you can do it with a much smaller sample size so i think i mentioned before that our uh, sample size is 7000 um, surveys per month we get back about 1400 so at that sample size, these dark blue dots here are the surf stratification estimates at different sample sizes. So you can see the percent standard error for those estimates is below 10% at a much lower sample size or a similar sample size than what we currently have. The, these higher um, dots up here are no stratification at all. So you can see the big difference in that PSE 
improvement between no stratification and the more uh, sophisticated stratification design. So we were very happy with these results. We think that um, the stratification design that we've developed through this survey is doing a very good job of reducing standard error around our estimates. And then lastly, um, we are attempting to independently validate the uh, accuracy of our fishing effort estimates. This is an example uh, on in the panhandle of Florida where we um, we actually put human observers out at different inlets and observed fishing boats going out those inlets into the Gulf of Mexico. And then we staged dockside interviews with private boat parties as they came in to find out how many of those boats were going out specifically for the purpose of fishing. You can see that our, our estimates during the two months that we did this, this is the inlet count estimate, and this is the uh, Gulf Reef Fish Survey estimate at the time. Um, they're not to dissimilar, um, one month the inlet count estimate was slightly higher. The next month, the um, um, the, sur the GERFs estimate was slightly higher, and those two balance each other out. So that gave us some confidence that we're not missing a lot of cryptic effort out there in our effort estimates. Um, so that doesn't really explain why our survey is so different from from the other one. We're expanding this work now on the Atlantic coast with uh, video cameras on these major inlets on the Atlantic coast. Um, we're pilot testing this right now on three inlets and we're working with a company called Sea Vision to develop artificial intelligence to read those videos and give us counts of boats that are going out through these inlets into the Atlantic. Um, this is, there's been a lot of logistics with this project, but um, we're pretty um, hopeful that we can expand this in the future to include some of these other inlets or even stage human observers like we did in the Panhandle of Florida to try and supplement this work. Um, so that is a, our um, ongoing attempt right now to validate our effort estimates over on the Atlantic coast. And this is just an example of what some of that camera footage looks like. This is Ponce Inlet. You can see the two jetties as with the boats coming in from the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so with that, um, that's the end of that's everything that I have. I'm happy to answer questions. I, again, I want to acknowledge Tiffany Cross, who runs a lot of the uh, state reef fish survey for uh, Florida, and Chloe Ramsey, who's, done, who's been very involved in a lot of the validation work and um, testing of error that I just talked about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Bev. I'm going to take uh, control back just to go over how to run the webinar again. Um, once again, if you want to, um, you can type your question into the question box uh, as represented by this bottom square here. Uh, if not, uh, click on the hand icon uh, to raise your hand. Um, if you want to know that your hand's raised, it should indicate that it's red. And then as I recognize people to speak, uh, the webinar will will recognize you, um, and then you'll need to turn this uh, microphone, you'll need to click on that to make sure it turns green. That means uh, people can hear you. And with that, I see Grayson has his hand raised. Grayson, you're unmuted. It's showing that you're self-muted right now. Hey, sorry, I must have uh, bad fingered it. I didn't really have a, a question at the moment. I think, I think I just made a mistake there. Oh, is it that little hard thing? Yep. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Okay, you can mute me again. Sorry, I'm in a loud restaurant. Just listening. Great okay. presentation, though. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Shep. Thanks, Chip. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, great presentation, Bev. I just wanted to ask, uh, relative to the lower response rates with younger people, do you know that your mail survey is getting to those people and they're not responding? And I was just thinking, you know, young people are moving around more. If you, maybe we don't have, or you, if the state doesn't have good addresses for those people, maybe they aren't actually getting the mail survey. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we. 
we do address checks before the survey goes out to make sure that the address is a valid address, but we do get quite a few back after the fact. But I don't think we've looked into the ages of people who those uh, return surveys are coming from. So yeah, that's an interesting question we could certainly look into. All right, uh, Mel has a question. Great job, Bev. Um, I've probably asked you this before, <laughs> but uh, how many how many uh, staff do you have that uh, um, works on the program, including the um, the mail part? Just that's one question, and then the other one is, assuming that you have a, you know a pay us is still uh, operating and you're operating this program, do they ever, uh, do you ever have conflicts at, 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 uh, at landings or uh, at the dock side of stuff where they kind of overlap each other? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so for the mail survey, we, I will say we, we do not print and mail the survey in-house. We have a, a company that does that for us and I highly recommend doing it that way. Um, Tiffany and I did that <laughs> the first month and we were like, we're never doing this again. <laughs> um, but we do have uh, one, or uh, I think two people who uh, receive the surveys back when they come in. And I don't know if you saw that picture when I was talking about the, our sample sizes, there was a woman putting those survey questionnaires through a scanner. Um, the scanner actually um, digitally reads the responses on those surveys and then we do some QAQC checks but there, we're not doing manual data entry on that on those returns we're actually scanning those surveys in so there's two people who just run that part um, Tiffany does the um, the a lot of the coding behind the sample draws and receiving all the files that go into um, doing that and oversees that project um, and then for your other question, uh, oh, bumping into each other in the field. Um, the, that was one of the main reasons that we wanted to work um, collaboratively with NOAA Fisheries on this survey is we, we do, our FWC actually does the APIS surveys in our state. So we didn't want to have our own staff bumping into each other in the field, um, doing multiple assignments at the same location. So by uh, working with NOAA Fisheries to provide that sample draw to us each month, they're actually selecting different samples without replacement from all of the sites in Florida so that we don't have assignments that fall on the same day and time at the same place. So that's been a, that's been a great help. That's great. That makes sense that you guys have uh, visibility of the whole thing. You can coordinate that and, and avoid it. And, and how many, how many actual creel clerks do you have in the field working just the state the state piece? Just the state piece. So we actually use them interchangeably. Uh, they are, you know, they charge their time accordingly based on what type of survey or assignment they're doing that day. Um, so I can't, I couldn't really break it out because <laughs> they're all working um, on the on both surveys. Um, yeah, that's good. That that makes sense. That, that that all makes sense the way you've got it set up. Good job. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thanks. All right. I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I'll ask a question. Um, you did have a limited number of species that you included in the in the surfs program, and I was just wondering how you did your selection process to come up with that list of species. Yeah, um, the intention behind the species that were selected was um, they are primary target species for um, recreational anglers in our state. And they're also species that are frequently targeted and caught together on the same trips. And so that's that was our um, kind of intention behind selecting those those species. The, the three new species that were added in 2020 needed to be added because when we added when we included when we expanded the survey statewide that also expanded the survey into the keys 
And those three species in particular are important to Southeast Florida and the Keys. Um, so that was the reason for increasing the number of species we included when we expanded statewide. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Oh, Carrie, I see you have your hand up. Thanks, Chip. Bev, I think you mentioned this, but I was distracted when you went through this part. Um, the refish is the add-on to the saltwater permit, correct? And it is at no charge to those folks. Um, and if that's correct, do you think that, and you might've said this, does it overinflate? do you think, how many people actually use the refish stamp versus um, if they had to pay for it, maybe? I'm not sure if it, is is related to the fact that it's free more so than how people are being selected to so i talked about that the differences that we were seeing between people who got their license online and actively signed themselves up for it versus people who purchased their license in person at a tackle shop and may be involuntarily signed up for it i think if there was a fee tied to that checkbox, then the vendor would be much more likely to ask a person whether they wanted to add that to their license or not. But what happens is because it's free, they just assume people are going to want it because it doesn't cost anything and they go ahead and check that box for them. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have another one. So a lot of this focused on the effort side of the survey, and I, I understand that because you're looking at some of those expansion factors, but you had mentioned that the fishing effort between a younger angler and an older angler might not be that, that different. Can you look at the dockside surveys to tease out if they are fishing differently between older and younger anglers? I don't, I didn't say that they might not be different. I, I think they cancel each other out um, because older anglers are more likely to respond to the survey, but they take fewer trips. That cancels out the younger anglers who are more likely to take a trip, but less likely to respond. <laughs> I know that's confusing, but essentially because they, they kind of cancel each other out, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. And then thinking back to your graph that you had for um, looking at the sources of uh, potential error, it, it, the the no correction with that showed that there there was basically no difference for age, but you did have it for the way that they signed up. Okay. Yeah, and and some of that may also be accounted for in the fact that maybe younger anglers are more likely to sign up over the internet versus older anglers who might be less likely to, to use the internet and might go to a tackle shop to get their license. Okay. Any other questions? Well, while I have you, I'm going to ask one more. Um, I, you know, you did indicate that during July that there were spikes and I, I think at least red snapper um, catches and does that spike in effort for the uh, red snapper fishing does that actually impact other species that are associated with it it didn't impact it as much in the MRIP estimates um, from what I could see and I, I guess it's because when that season opens that's that's what gets intercepted as red snapper. Okay, so it's just red snapper that the that spike in effort really impacts. Yeah, it seemed to be. Mel, go ahead. Thanks, Chip. Yeah, I know I probably asked you this for sure, but approximately um, how much does the program cost you all total? Uh, a year and realizing you're covering two coasts, it's it's. You know, I'm 
just kind of trying to get a handle on about about what that runs yeah so this um we received uh long-term state funding in 2020 that's when we expanded the survey to the atlantic coast we get about three million dollars a year from the state for reef fish surveys which includes both the state reef fish survey and the at sea observer program and it also includes some, some of the funding for the um, specialized atlantic coast red snapper harvest season and as you mentioned that also covers those surveys on both coasts so that's our number but i have never broken it out to just the cost to run the state reef fish survey on one coast i believe when we pilot tested it on the gulf side i want to say it was running around uh just under a million like 700k maybe a year okay thank you mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, I am not seeing any others. Bev, thank you so much for your presentation today. I think it was uh, very informative for this uh, interesting topic and we appreciate all the work that you and the staff at FWRI and FWC are doing uh, in order to improve uh, recreational estimates. So thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thank you all and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks, Chip. Thanks, Bev. Thanks.